Hello and welcome to the Normans What Happened in 1066 and Why Is It So Important? So, uh, 1066 is one of those dates that everybody knows. If you ask anyone any date about English history, it is always 1066 and the Battle of Hastings. And it's not just because of annoying jingles in car insurance adverts, it is actually one of the most important years in English history. And it all comes down to this man here, William the Conqueror. So in order to understand what happened in 1066, we're going to begin by looking at Edward the Confessor, who reigned in England from 1042 until 1066. Now, traditionally, when a king dies, the throne will pass on to their eldest son. This is a system called primogeniture. As you can probably tell from that family tree, Edward the Confessor didn't have a son. Now, the throne could possibly have passed to his eldest nephew, Edgar the Atheling, However, he was just a young child with no army and was in exile at the time, so he really wasn't a major candidate. So three other men stepped in. We have Harold Godwinton, the Earl of Wessex, so a Saxon, an Englishman, a very powerful man. We're going to look at him in more detail in a moment. William of Normandy, so he was the Duke of Normandy, a Norman in north of France, um, again, very, very powerful and Harald Hadrada, king of Norway. So he was a king, obviously, great amount of power. And all three of these men felt that they had a right to take the throne. So we're going to examine each of their claims to the throne and see why they felt they should have been king of England. So beginning with Harald Hadrada. So you can see there circled is Ethelred the Unready. He was the king of England until 1016 when Canute the Great invaded. So during 1016, Ethelred was killed. His son, Edmund Ironside, briefly became king between April and November, but it never really established power over the English. So in the end, we end up with Canute the Great as king of England until um, 1035, when he dies and his son, Arthur Canute, becomes King of England. Now, as you can see, Half Canute doesn't have any children either. So you can see the little dotted arrows next to them there. Um, he made an agreement with um, Magnus the Good of Norway that Magnus could become king if Half Canute were to die first, or Half Canute would become king of Norway if Magnus were to die first. Now, in that event, Hathcanut died first, so Magnus would have become King of England. But Magnus was busy fighting wars at the time, so instead of Magnus becoming King of England, Edward the Confessor took the throne. So as you can see there, Edward the Confessor is a child of Ethelred the Unready and his wife Emma. She's an important woman who we're going to come back to later on. So, Harold Hadrada, um, apologies, just going back one slide there. So, Harold Hadrada, on the death of Edward the Confessor, felt that he should have taken the throne because Magnus the Good, his half brother, he felt should have been King of England, not Edward the Confessor. So, therefore, Harold Hadrada felt that he had the right to the English throne. So his half-brother, Magnus of Good Norway, had been promised the throne by Hathcanut. That is one of his main claims. He believed the people in the north of England would support him. Again, many of the people living in the north of England were of Viking descent. And he also had the support of a very important person, Harold Godwinson's brother, Tostig, so a very powerful English noble. Moving on to Harold Godwinson. So Harold Godwinson isn't directly um, related to Edward Confessor. He's, he's not a royal as such. However, his sister Edith was married to Edward the Confessor. So that would make him um, his brother-in-law. So Edward the Confessor and Harold Godwinson were brother-in-laws. His claim was based around the idea that one, his wife, um, sorry, his brother's, he's the brother of Edward Confessor's wife, Edith. Harold had been promised a throne by Edward the Confessor 
in his deathbed. So when Edward Confessor was dying, he had promised the throne to Harold Godwinson. Harold Godwinson was a very, very powerful Englishman, a Witten, an uh, intelligent group of councillors, as you might see them, had backed Harold Godwinson the claim, particularly due to the power that he held over the English. And finally, he had actually been ruling England anyway as what's called a sub regulus for most of Edward Confessor's reign, because Edward the Confessor, with his men, was far too busy dealing with religion and his piety, so he actually didn't really rule England, in fact, and Harold Wilkinson had done it for him. So he was actually pretty well trained in running England, he knew what he was doing, it would really be a continuation of the same government. So there we have Harold Godwinson's claim. Moving on, you've got William of Normandy. So his claim is a little bit more complex. So again, circled in the bottom there, we have Edward the Confessor. Now, Edward the Confessor, his mum was Emma, as we talked about earlier. Now, Emma was a Norman. She was the daughter of Richard I of Normandy. This made her William the Conqueror's great aunt. So he was, in fact, related to Edward Confessor. They were distant cousins. So this gave him a relatively strong claim. However, there are some issues, but we'll go through them in a moment. So the great aunt was the mother of Edward Confessor, making third cousins. However, the big problem is that William was a bastard. So bastard meaning that his parents were not married at the time of his birth. Now, William's father, Robert I of Normandy, had an affair with a peasant woman. She was a tanner. She worked in making leather. Um, so William the Conqueror was born out of wedlock, making him a bastard. Now, this created a few issues, mainly that he wasn't allowed to inherit. But as his father had no other son, William did inherit. Not everyone saw it that way, however, so it was a problem for William uh, throughout most of his life. Um, so Edward had also been promised the throne, sorry, uh, William had been promised the throne by Edward in 1051. So what had happened in 1051 was Harold Godwinson's father, Earl Godwin, had led a rebellion against Edward. Now, William helped Edward by sending him troops and support. This was because they were quite friendly. Edward had actually grown up in Normandy. So in return, Edward had promised William the throne. As well as this, Harold Godwinson himself had promised to support William's claim to the throne in 1064 as well. So in theory, William has a very, very strong claim. However, Harold Godwinson did state that he only uh, promised to support William um, under duress, so he didn't actually want to support William, the claim was forced to. And this then led to an issue with who, whose promise make, uh, do you choose, because Edward had promised the throne to both William and Harold Godwinson, the Normans felt that a promise made on the deathbed was not as important as a promise made earlier on in life. However, the Saxons felt that a promise made on the deathbed was more important than a promise made earlier on in life. So both cultures saw things in a different way. So what actually happened in 1066? So expecting the invasion, Harold Godwinson spent the summer on the south coast with his army awaiting William of Normandy. However, William of Normandy didn't even begin to arrive until the 12th of September, when William began to assemble his fleet in the mouth of the Somme River. But on the 18th of September, Harold had rather invaded in the north. This was a bit of a shock to Harold Godwinson. So they invaded in the north, at Scarborough. Part of the problem here is because this is so late on in the year, Harold Godwinson's forces had started to go back home because many of the soldiers were actually just farmers who had been pressed into supporting the king's uh, fight as part of their duties. But as the harvest was due, they had to go home and bring it in, meaning that his, his army wasn't quite as strong as it should have been. So on the 20th of September, Harold Hadrada defeated two English earls, Edwin and Morcar, at the Battle of Fulford. Following this, 
After the quick march north, Harold Godwinson defeated Harold Hadrada at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Famously, at this battle, one um, Viking berserker stood on the bridge and stopped the entire Anglo-Saxon army and was only defeated by a sneaky attack when two of the Anglo-Saxons climbed into a barrel upriver, sailed in it downriver and stabbed the berserker up um, from below the bridge. Following this, the Anglo-Saxons crossed the river and were able to defeat the Viking invaders. One of the main reasons for this is they were surprised by this attack and hadn't had their armour on, so they were far easier to kill. But then on the 27th of September, William sets sail. He lands on the 28th at Pevensey. So on the 6th of October, Harold Godwinson, having just defeated Harold Godrada, has to march back down south. On the 15th of October, they meet at the Battle of Hastings, in which William is famously wins and Harold Godwinson famously dies. Harold Godwinson surrounding his death is little unsure. Quite famously in the Bayard Tapestry we see an arrow in his eye. However there's been some debate as to whether the character with the arrow in his eye is actually supposed to be Harold Godwinson as there is another man who more resembles the figure of Harold Godwinson earlier seen in the tapestry who is being cut down by a knight instead. In either case William won the Battle of Hastings and soon became King of England, being crowned on the 25th of December at Westminster Abbey. So why is this so important? So why, why is 1066 such an important year? A lot of changes happened, is the answer. There are a lot of changes to English society. One of the main changes was the feudal system. Now, the English already had a similar system, but it wasn't as regimented as the feudal system that was brought over from the Normans. So it worked as a pyramid. At the top, you have the king, who in theory owns all the land in England. Um, so what he does is he passes land down below him to the barons. Now, the barons have been given large swathes of land. They can't work at all, so then they divides their land out amongst knights. The knights then divide their land between peasants, so you have peasants working in different fields. Um, now, what does the king get in return for this? So the peasants work the land of the field, uh, sorry, they work the land, they work the fields. So then any of the crops that they grow, or a large proportion of them, are to be given to the knights. These can be sold for profit, or can be uh, taxed. The knights then take the money that they gain from giving the land to the peasants and pay it as a form of tax to the barons, which the barons then pay back to the king. So the money filters up to the top, eventually reaching the king, with everyone gaining from the deal, really other than peasants, who don't really get much out of it other than just a place to live and work. Another major issue with being a peasant is that some were designated serfs. Serfs didn't have the right to leave the village that they lived in. They had to work the land that they were given to work on. If they were given land to work on, it could be taken away from them. And they couldn't go to another village as this was banned. They had to ask the permission of a landowner, uh, their local knight, in order to get married as well. So they were akin to slavery, though not quite slaves. So this feudal system was incredibly important in England as it helped run the country and made it quite a profitable country to run. Uh, this lasted until debatably the Tudor period in which um, you started to see some of the lower classes um, gain money through becoming merchants and becoming this merchant class. So moving on from there, we have language. So the Normans didn't speak English, they spoke Norman French. And as a result of the invasion, over 10,000 new words that, um, became part of the English language. In fact, the kings of England spoke French until Henry IV in 1399, um, although Norman French is still part of our legal system today. In fact, when the Queen passes a law, it's at Lorraine level, and the Queen wills it. So a large influence of Norman French still plays part in our parliamentary democracy. 
Now, the words that started to change tended to be do, to do with governing. So words from Norman French that became part of the English language were things like council, parliament, clerk, sovereign, judge, jury, evidence, justice, government, crown, and castle. All of these words are to do with governing or power, demonstrating that the people who were governing and had power were in fact the Norman French. So there we have our French flag there. But other words change to do with class as well. So we've got our poor Saxon peasant on the left and our rich Norman noble on the right. So if you were a peasant, when you were looking after these animals, you had a cow or you had sheep or you had swine. But by the time they'd been butchered and served up on the table, they had become beef, mutton and pork. The difference there being that the wealthy people, the wealthy Normans, didn't really do any farming. That was left to the peasants. So they used their words for them once they had actually been served up as food, whereas as they were seen as live animals, they still retained, maintained the Saxon name. So, in addition, a peasant would enter a room, whereas a Norman would enter a chamber. A peasant might buy a shirt, whereas a Norman might purchase a blouse. There's also a difference between class and jobs as well. So the peasants are doing the lower level work, such as being a baker, a miller, or a shoemaker, whereas a Norman might be a painter, a tailor, or a merchant. And again, we see those French words joining uh, part of the English language. The other major thing that the Normans are famous for and why they are so important is bringing castles to England. So we have the famous Mott and Bailey Castle there on the left. These were used when the Normans first invaded England and enabled them to establish control despite being a minority over the majority English or Anglo-Saxon people. They were very easy to assemble. They were made of wood. In fact, um, one of them, although um, being a flat pack as it were, Castle Porto over during the invasion, was assembled in just eight days um, at Dover. The castle on the right is a Norman square keep. So once the Normans had been in England for a while and established their control, they could then have the time and the money to build stronger castles. And it's in that case when we start to see the square keep. Norman architecture as well uh, pervaded England. We see it in Canterbury Cathedral, in many of the cathedrals throughout the country. And it is its own sense of architecture now as well. So that is a roundup of what happened in 1066 and why it was so important. So to summarize, 1066 or the dead, death of Edward the Confessor that led England into a year of war in which William the Conqueror came out on top. As a result of the Norman invasion, England changed dramatically. A language was changed forever. They had incredibly different new styles of architecture and power their castles and finally the social structure of the country changed as well with the introduction of the feudal system i hope this video has been helpful if you have any questions please send me an email thank you guys bye, -bye.